tried to share a little bit from Brother Helm's message at the waiting. Uh, what a blessing it was, and then to try to share a little more about it. And uh, I thought, I know a number of you didn't get to the waiting, and so I thought tonight it might be good to share another of a little message Paul Hill preached. Paul preached on Jonah, and uh, so I try to help you to, to share with you a little something of what Paul, or what Paul uh, said at the waiting, and then maybe also to share a little extra on it too. So if you have your Bibles and want to turn back to the book of Jonah, uh, we might look at some of these things. Uh, I'll try to mention some of the things that Paul said in his message, and then uh, we'll try to look at a few other things too along with it. I was, I was really blessed when Paul Hill preached on Jonah. I just, uh, it was a blessing to me. And uh, so let's pray just a moment. Father, again we come in the name of Jesus and we want to thank thee and praise thee again for how you spoke through your servants at the waiting. Now, Jesus, there's some dear ones we're not there. And we pray, Jesus, you'll help us to be able to share some tonight that they might be strengthened and helped. We all might be. We ask in Jesus' name, give me a new anointing from thee and give us the illumination upon the word. Pray in Jesus' name. Of course, you know, I suppose all of you are familiar with the story. God called Jonah to go to Nineveh, and he didn't want to go. Paid his fare and went to Tarshish instead. And while there on board the ship, why God created a great storm. And uh, one thing I remember Paul said was that Jonah was fast asleep, and he said that sleep was a false rest. Yeah. I thought that's certainly true, that some of you dear ones are tossed by the devil and in turmoil, but I want to tell you something, it would be better to be that way than to be in a false rest of the devil. So he was in a false rest. And uh, so we're thankful. We have to resist the devil. I'd resist the devil right then for trying to tell me something here. Now, that's a good point. You know, isn't that something he just, I don't know whether you are that way or not, but he, I just have to fight him sometimes all the time. Yes, sir. Right. So Satan, get behind you and resist you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes. Uh, so, uh, I think another thing Paul brought out was that these men, the ungodly, these godly men had to awaken Jonah to pray. They had to come down and awaken him to pray uh, in a situation of this kind. Uh, and I marveled as I looked at this story that here these ungodly men were the ones that wanted to pray, and also it was the ungodly people of Nineveh who believed God. In that uh, third chapter, it says the people of Nineveh believed God. And here are the ungodly people in this situation. Well, I want to read, uh, starting with the second chapter of Jonah, it says Jonah prayed... This is after he had been thrown out, and uh, the fish swallowed him. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord, his God, out of the fish's belly, and said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me. And out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. For thou hadst cast me into the deep, in the midst of the seas and the floods compassed me about, all thy billows, thy waves passed over me. Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight, yet I will look again toward thy holy temple. The waters compassed me about even to the soul. The depth closed me round about. The weeds were wrapped about my head. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever. Yet hast thou brought me up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came in unto thee into thine holy temple. 
They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. But I will sacrifice unto thee with a voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that I have vowed salvation is of the Lord. And the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon dry land. Now, I, some years ago, I heard a preacher touch on a little verse here that I want to emphasize it to you and trust that it will help us. That eighth verse, it says, They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. Now, if you'll see the situation where Jonah was, uh, he was in the, the belly of this fish, down in the stomach of this fish, down in the depth of the sea, and he's making this statement, if you observe or you look at lying vanities, you will forsake your own mercy. Now, if we will look at, at lying vanities, you know what a lying vanity is? Well, it could be our senses. It could be our reason. How many things, when God leads us, tell us that it can't possibly be so? It can't be. And Jonah now, in this situation, refused to look at everything that was contrary to God. He said, if you will observe these lying vanities, you will forsake your own mercy. Now, everything, everything that Jonah looked at lied to him. The seaweed about his head said, you, go, you won't make it. The stomach of that fish said, you're gone. If he looked and could look at all at that vast body of water in, in it, would have said to him, uh, Jonah, you're as good as dead. You'll never get to dry land again. You're done for. And everything that he could look at, Jonah said, was a lying vanity. Now, if when God speaks to us, if we could look, if we could look at the right thing instead of the wrong thing, if we look at the wrong thing, it'll lie to us. It will be a lying vanity. If we look at anything other than what God says, I don't care how impossible it is, like Brother Terry, when the revelation came to go to Israel, it looked impossible. Everything said you can't go. But it was a lie, wasn't it? It was a lie. But it said to Terry, you can't go saw what but the revelation was he could go and uh, John has said if you observe and keep looking at these lying vanities you'll forsake your own mercy so it's important where we as God's children look we cannot look to our senses we cannot look to reason we cannot look to the impossibilities if we look at those, we will forsake our own mercy. Because they are lying vanities. And I heard somebody say that vanity is... Uh, somebody was preaching one time from Ecclesiastes. I think it was vanity of vanities. All is vanity. And I don't know where he, whether it's the actual translation or what, but he said that means so, like a soap bubble. That looks so, maybe so pretty and floating, looks beautiful, and you reach out for it, and it's gone. So a vanity is something that will not hold up. It isn't real, but it looks good. And if we observe that and look at that, we will forsake the mercy of God. Now, what Jonah said instead... 
notice the fourth verse. He said, I won't look at these flying vanities, but he said, I will look again toward thy holy temple. Now, how he could do that, of course, it would have had to have been by faith. Now, I, I, uh, there, uh, I want to turn back and just look. I, I don't know exactly what Jonah had in mind, but I have a feeling that he had in mind Solomon's great prayer when the temple was dedicated, and it's, I think it's in the 8th chapter of First Kings. I'd like to read some of that. When Solomon dedicated that great temple... Let's start with the 31st verse. It's a beautiful prayer, and we can't, we can't read it all. But Solomon, in praying this beautiful dedication of prayer, he's, yeah, I think he's standing or kneeling with his hands raised to heaven, praying the beautiful dedication, the 33rd verse, the 8th chapter. When thy people Israel be smitten down before the enemy because they've sinned against thee, and shall turn again to thee, and confess thy name, and pray, and make supplication unto thee in this house. Now, the center column reference says toward, and there's, I don't know how many places there is in here, it uses in and toward, and they're, they're, they're interchangeable, for if they could get in the house, get there, but if they were out of Israel, even out of the country, if they would confess their sin, and pray toward that house, because God was there, look toward it, pray toward it. Then, then he said, the 34th verse, Then hear thou in heaven, and forgive the sin of thy people Israel, and bring them again unto the land which thou gavest unto their fathers. When the heaven is shut up, and there is no rain, because they have sinned against thee, if they pray toward this place, and confess thy name, and turn from their sin, when, the, when thou afflictest them, then hear thou in heaven, and forgive the sin of thy servants, and of thy people Israel, that thou teach them the good way, wherein they should walk, and give rain upon thy land, which thou hast given to thy people for an, in, for an inheritance. Let's see, he goes on to talk anyway. I'll not read all the rest of that down there. Well, the 38th verse, but on if they've sinned, whatever, what prayer and supplication soever is made by any man, or by all thy people Israel, which shall... No, every man, the plague of his own heart, spread forth his hands toward this house. Then hear thou in heaven thy dwelling place, and forgive, and do, and give to every man according to his ways, whose, whose, hurt, uh, whose heart thou knowest. For thou, even thou only, knowest the hearts of all the children of men. Well, it goes on down there, different things. If you have sinned, uh, and you will look toward this place, Oh, God, here in heaven, and forgive their sin and deliver them. If you've sinned in this way, and you'll turn and look toward this holy place, then, oh, God in heaven, hear you and forgive your people and deliver them. And he goes on down, one sin after another, if they'll only confess it and ask God to forgive it and look toward this holy tomb. I guess that's what we did tonight, isn't it? We were asking God to forgive us of our sins. And uh, so, but here's, here anyway, here's Jonah. Not read any more of that this a number of times he said, if they'll look toward this holy place. So Jonah said, I will look again toward thy holy temple. And I, he had to do that by faith because I'm sure he didn't know any direction. I don't think he knew any direction down there in the fish's stomach. But by faith, he somehow looked toward Jerusalem and he remembered what God said. This beautiful prayer that was prayed, Oh God, if your people sin, you'll hear from heaven. And there, there's where he looked. He looked to God, he looked to the temple, he looked to what God said in his mercy and his love, and, and he refused to look at everything about him. He said is a lying vanity, and he said, I'm going to look toward the holy temple. And he said, But I will sacrifice unto thee with a voice of thanksgiving. And I thought, what a place to begin to give thanks to God. My, oh my, oh my, oh my. When everything about him said it's lost, you're gone, or you'll not make it. In a situation where you're in, I have no idea, and I don't suppose any man has any idea what it'd be in, like and be a fish down in a fish. And yet he said, I will sacrifice unto thee with a voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that I have vowed. I'm not sure, but I have an idea that the vow here 
was that as a prophet of God, he had promised that he would proclaim God's message, and now he was running. So he, I think he's really telling God, Lord, all right, I'll, I'll do it, I'll do it. Salvation is of the Lord. And the Lord spake unto the fish and vomited him out, Jonah, out upon dry ground. I thought again, the mercy of the Lord, the Lord could have had him drop him out in the water. But he had the fish taken clear up to the land and put him out on the dry land. So the word of the Lord came again to Jonah the second time. And Jonah this time went. I, I think I got a little new glimpse into to this. I'm not sure, but I kind of believe the cross is really in this chapter just a little bit. Uh, I always thought that Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh because he didn't like the people. They weren't Israelites, and no doubt that was part of it. But I think I caught a little new glimpse in here as another reason why he didn't want to go. And uh, I'm not sure, but let's look at it and read in the fourth chapter. When God saw that these people, the whole city repented. God saw the, this is the tenth chapter, the third, the, I mean the third chapter, the tenth verse. God saw their works that they had turned from the evil way, and God repented of the evil that he had said he would do to them, and he did it not, but he displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Now, I got a little glimpse of something here that I think I'd never seen before. When God said, go to Nineveh, he didn't want to go because already he's, he knew he knew before he went that God would have mercy on them. He said, was not this, Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country before I ever started for Tarshish? Isn't this what I said? That you would have mercy on them? Now, therefore, I fled before unto Tarshish. I, never, I don't know that I ever saw that before. He's telling God, now, God, this is why I went to Tarshish. I knew, I knew you'd have mercy on me. But yet you wanted me, you wanted me to go down and say you'd destroy them, and I knew you'd have mercy on me. That's why I went to Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. Now, I think, don't, I don't know, but I, I have a feeling, and I might be wrong in it here, but I kind of have a feeling that Jonah's reputation was at stake. And the Bible says that when a man prophesies something and it doesn't come true, he's a false prophet. And it would sure look like Jonah was a false prophet if, it didn't, if God didn't destroy this city. Mm -hmm. It would look like he was a false prophet in the eyes of lots of people. This man went through the city saying God's going to destroy this city in 40 days. And he said, now God, I knew you would have mercy on them and I fled. Jonah's reputation was at stake. And the cross, at the end of the picture, he had to die to self, really, to proclaim God's message and be a misunderstood prophet and let people claim him as a false prophet. But he didn't want to do it, and he fled from it. But really, he had to die to self, really, and allow, and it's hard telling how many people in Jonah's day that thought he was a false prophet because of this. But he said, God, I knew you were gracious slow to anger and would repent. So he said, Lord, it's better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, do you well to be angry? And Jonah went out of the city, sat on the east side of the city, and there made him a booth and sat under it in the shadow till he might see what would become of the city. And the Lord God prepared a gourd and made it to come up over Jonah that it might be a shadow over his head to deliver him from his grief. So Jonah was exceeding glad over the gourd. I think somebody pointed out, I believe, seemed to me like, and I don't remember just who. Isn't it interesting in this particular chapter what, 
what it is that the human heart can get glad about and what we can get displeased about and what we don't rejoice over that we should rejoice over. He was glad for a gourd and he was displeased because God spared Nineveh. He was angry over that, but he was really happy about a gourd. But God prepared a worm when the morning rose the next day, and it smote the gourd that it withered, and it came to pass when the sun did arise that God prepared a vehement east wind. And the sun beat upon the head of Jonah that he fainted and wished in himself to die and said, It is better for me to die than to live. And God said to Jonah, Doest thou well to be angry for the gourd? First he was glad about it and then angry about it. And he said, I do well to be angry even unto death. Then the Lord said, Thou hast had pity on the gourd, for which thou hast not labored, neither madest it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. Should I not spare Nineveh, that great city, wherein are more than six score thousand persons that cannot discern between the right hand and their left and all so much cattle. Ends with a question mark and leaves it. But isn't it interesting, again, what the human heart can get happy about, sad about, angry about, displeased about, and the great things of God. It just seems like we aren't concerned about. When God wanted to spare, uh, I think Paul Hill said 120,000 people, God wanted to spare them, and yet here it is, he, he would rather have seen 120,000 people die than to have his own reputation destroyed, or he's upset over the gourd, but not 120,000 people. Well, I think it's a picture of the human heart. It isn't a picture of Jonah. It's a picture of the human heart, of what we can get upset about, what we can get angry about. And the great things of God that are eternal that we should be concerned about, we're not concerned about. So I see a picture here of the human heart, and it's going to take God to help us to know what to get upset about and what to get angry about. I mean angry in the sense of righteous indignation about the things of the enemy and loving God and the things to be concerned about and the things not to be concerned about. If not, we'll still get upset over a gourd, something that goes up in a day and is gone in a day. But oh, that God could help us again to get our eyes off of the temporal things that are here in a day and gone in a day and get our eyes with God. We may have to, we will, we'll have to die to self someplace along the line to let God do it. And I trust that God will help us all to take the way of the cross so that we might be willing to let 120,000 live if we have our reputation has to go. And by God's grace, we'll be willing to let it go uh, in order that 120,000 might live. So God save us from being more concerned about the little temporal things that are for the moment and losing sight of the eternal things that are forever. I'll take Jesus to help us in this or we'll be just like Jonah. So I don't want to stand and preach and condemn Jonah. I want to see a picture here of the human heart and say, Jesus, if you don't help me, I'll be just like Jonah. So I pray God to help us to know what's of value, what to get upset about, and what not to get upset about. And what to get displeased about, and what not to get displeased about. And if Jesus doesn't help me, I'll be the same way as Jonah, and I'll find myself displeased over something that's so temporal that won't make any difference. So I pray Jesus to help us in this. We try to pass along again a little of waiting and share it with you.